Our uh, <coughs> last talk is titled The Structure and Poleward Propagation of the Boreal Summer Interseasonal Oscillation. And if you don't quite understand what that means, it's okay because Dingmar is here to tell you. Thank you all for staying here with me. Uh, it's 5 already. A while ago, I had a presentation at 5 p.m. on Friday night, Friday afternoon, of a huge conference, AGU. And that's the very last talk of whole AGU. I was upset and I told my PhD advisor, I was the last one, what can I do? And my PhD advisor told me, people always save the, last for, the, save the best for the last. Well, it turns out that he left one day before my talk, so. <laughs> Again, anyways, thank you for staying here with me. And today I'm going to talk about the flavors of intraseasonal oscillations. So here I'm showing the train precipitation. So it's precipitation based on satellite observation. Kyle was using the, this data set too, because, uh, probably because of its great coverage and accuracy, etc. So we are looking at the, uh, the Asian monsoon region, and color shows precipitation, and the contour shows spatially and temporarily smooth precipitation. So let me wait until it starts again. OK, here, it's initiated in the Indian Ocean and propagates eastward still going and stretched and dying, splitting. So here is an example of the intraseasonal oscillations I'm going to talk about, or ISOs. ISOs exhibit prominent seasonal variations. Left panel, so here I'm showing the OLR variance. OLR is short for outgoing long wave radiation, a proxy for precipitation. And here I'm showing the OLR variance during boreal winter and boreal summer on the right. You can see that in boreal winter, so this color measures the activity of the ISOs. In boreal winter, it's warmer in the southern hemisphere, and ISOs are more active in the southern hemisphere as expected. And in the boreal summer, um, the ISOs moves northward as the sun moves northward. Um, in the, so in the boreal winter, again, we have something called the madden julian oscillation, or the MGO. It is the dominant mode that, that's propagating eastward, as I have shown in the trailer. And here, um, I'm trying to repeat the concept of MGO. We are looking at longitude, x-axis longitude, and y-axis time. Time goes up. So it's averaged between 10 south and 10 north. So a channel over the, over the equator. And you see signals of precipitation going this way, which means they are propagating eastward in time. And that's the MGO. So this ones, these phenomena are really important in the climate system for many, many reasons. Of course, they are scientifically, scientifically very interesting. Besides, they bring precipitation to all around the places. For example, India. They bring precipitation to India and contribute to the crops in India and other places. And also, they interact with other phenomena. For example, monsoon, hurricanes, and so many other things. So they are a key component of the climate system. And moreover, in, in addition to all I just said, they are a bridge between weather and climate because of their own unique time scale. As in the name of this phenomena, it's called intraseasonal oscillation. It has a time scale between 20 days to around 90 days, roughly. So you can see. It's a linkage between synoptic time scale, which is a few days, to longer time scales, the climate time scale. So these ones are really important. And as I said, in boreal winter, it's 
comparatively simple. It's not simple at all. MGO is barely understood. It's not simple at all. But the boreal winter case is simpler compared to the boreal summer case. Because during boreal summer, there's something propagating northward besides the eastward propagation we just saw. And it has been it has been intensively studied recently, and people coined this word B cell or C cell or whatever you call it to to uh, to summarize this kind of northward propagating thing. And we can see that again in trim data, this time average between 85 east and 95 east, so zonally average. This is time now, x-axis time, and y-axis latitude. So we are looking at um, Bay of Bengal, this sector around, around Bay of Bengal. And we see, uh, so this precipitation in 2008, this summer, and we see signals of precip precip precipitation propagating this way along the red lines. That's, that's saying there are signals of precipitation going northward. And that's the so-called BSO, BSISO, Boreal Summer Interstitial Oscillations. And these ones are particularly interesting and important because they greatly contribute to the Indian summer monsoon. So we see active, during the summer monsoon season, due to June to around early September, we see active phase, a lot of precipitation, and a dry phase, there's little precipitation, and you can see that those phase, dry and active phase, can be traced back to the tropics, and it's linked to the BSISO. And we see that for every year, many cases in each year. We want to understand why they propagate northward. And before that, we have to define what we are studying. We know the name, it's BSISO or BSO, CISO. But the, the definition is as vague as the pronunciation of the, of the thing. People have been using EOF analysis, empirical orthogonal functions, to define this phenomena. And UF, for those who are not familiar with, it's some method to find a special pattern that maximizes the variance which the pattern explains. So here, they using this method, they found the two dominant patterns in boreal summer in this region. Uh, again, in terms of OLR, uh, so negative OLR, bluish colors, indicates active convection, more precipitation with the negative OLR. Those two UFs show, so we can, we can try to see how those, how, how those precipitation or OLR signals propagate using this UF analysis by compositing uh, by compositing OLR and circulation according to the phase of the two leading UFs I just showed. So according to this method, we have um, precipitation start initiating in Indian Ocean here, phase one, and it starts to enhance and propagates north eastward a little bit and going this way and jumps over there. So in phase five, we have a stretched pattern of precipitation over um, partly South China Sea and Indian too. And it moves eastward and northward at the same time. So it's quite a simple of picture of the life cycle of this phenomena. We see something going uh, we see something e evolving. It starts in the ocean and going eastward, stretching, and going northward at, at the same time. Quite simple, right? But 
if we look at something from observation, so left panel data, OLR lag regressions from observations directly from no R OLR. Um, it's zonally averaged between 80 and 90 east, and the reference point is uh, around 5 to 10. The bull's eye shows, shows you where the reference point for the regression is, and x-axis is lag time, and y-axis is latitude. So on the lag regression plot, you see signals pro propagating northward. But if we use re reconstructed OLR by the UFs I just showed you, I just showed you, we don't see any northward propagation. We don't see much according to the UF. So what's wrong with the UF? It does conflict. Lead, leads us to ask the question, is the EOF too simplified? Otherwise, it cannot, the conflict I showed you cannot be explained. So I'm proposing we have to take one step back and ask ourselves, what are we talking about when we talk about the B cell? What are the B cell exactly? And it's an important question because the mechanisms for the northward propagation are associated with the structure of the B cell. If you look at the UFs, if you identify, if you if we track B cell using the UF analysis, we are assuming this phenomena has a zonally stretched structure by default as the UFs. It's not necessarily true, as I just showed you, there's conflict. And it's important because structures of the phenomena are, are associated with mechanisms. There are many mechanisms proposed for this phenomena. For example, there are instabilities, assuming the phenomena is zonally symmetric. And there are other theories for example, this one is saying um, the northward propagation comes from uh, wave emanating from from active convections. So that if the theory, if the second theory is correct, the phenomena will have will have this horseshoe shape structure, and that's the second one. And the last one is saying that um, due to due to meridional gradients of vorticity. Uh, it's going to generate um, some ano anomalous circulations called beta gyres, and the beta gyres is going to ad advance the convection anomaly northward. And if this theory is correct, the phenomenon will have a zonally narrow structure. So we really have to understand how do the phenomena look like before moving on to the next step to understand why it propagate northward. Right? And that's the approach we are taking. We are using the methods, uh, I don't know, invented by Stoneman, by tracking each individual event. Uh, so again, we are using TRIM satellite data, and that's the steps I take. First, uh, because precipitation is really noisy, we have to do a lot of smoothing smoothing in time and smoothing in space. And then with smooth precipitation, uh, the next step is to do thresholding, find conti contiguous shape structures higher than a threshold of 11 millimeter per day, which is beyond 90% quantile. And the last step is to track uh, the features we, we found in each snapshot of of precipitation. So movies, as I promised, um, so here I'm showing one example of the, the individual events of ISO we found. So this one started here and going eastward, and during the propagation, during the evolution, it's, it becomes stretched right as the UF predicts.
so here we have a life cycle which resembles the life cycle as predicted by the US pretty well. I call it uh, plain vanilla because um, that's people, that's most of people are, are picturing this phenomena right now. And that's another example. It started in the Indian Ocean. Well, it did not move much eastward, and it's never zonally elongated, right? So it's totally different from the picture depicted by the UFs. So we got another flavor, chocolate, my personal favorite. So in total, we have 197 events, and for each event, uh, we have the tracks in terms of longitude and latitude, and we have uh, a shape, because uh, as I said, the shape is very important for this phenomena. I want to include the shape in the, in the study, and also we have the strength in terms of total precipitation. So we have all the dimensions for each one of the events. Let's get back to the vanilla. That's the uh, x-axis is time, normalized time. So it begins, uh, it begins here in the Indian Ocean, 80 degrees in longitude, and going eastward, if you still remember. And latitude, it moves northward a little bit, right? For the shape, uh, it fluctuates a bit. Uh, we'll talk about that later. And strength, the strength is first and decays later. The blue curve is um, smooth in time, and the red curve is a polynomial fit, cubic polynomial fit. So I have a dozen of numbers for each of the events, which is the fingerprint of the uh, events. Is that clear? So I have 12 numbers for each of the events. Any event can be summarized in 12 numbers. And I have another example, the chocolate one. Um, does not change much in longitude because it stays in the Indian Ocean. And northward propagation shape. This one is much smaller. The shape property is much smaller compared to the vanilla because it's zonally narrow, right? So I have the, the set of fingerprints for 197 events. I'm going to classify them because I want to know uh, how many are there. And here I'm using uh, unsupervised learning or uh, clustering in more Tao language. And these 197 events can be class classified into 10 clusters. So 10 is an arbitrary number I chose, but it does not, it does not matter much if the number is, uh, is around this range. And as you can see, the first seven clusters, the, the members in the first seven clusters are much more than the rest. So we'll be focusing on the first seven clusters. Um, here I'm showing the tracks for the play vanilla, which goes eastward, but not much northward, if you remember. And the tracks for chocolate. It stays in the Indian Ocean going northward. And there are other flavors. This one basically starts in West Pacific and it's going northwestward. And more, um, this one stays in West Pacific. Not that interesting, so I call it chocolate uh, mint. Hmm. All right, so we can see more movies. Um, so that's one example of the third cluster. The one starts in West Pacific and going, going this way. And cluster number four, um, the one stays in Western, Western Pacific. So this one is mostly driven by large scale circulation. We have high pressure here and circulation this way, which makes the anomalies to go around the high pressure. And we have more tracks. So the first seven are interesting. I showed you the first four already. And that's the rest of the uh, 
first seven. So they look like some kind of mixture between the first four flavors. Um, and more movies, if you like. I guess I'll skip those ones. We don't have popcorns. Yep, so um, here's the conclusion. Um, for the phenomena called BSSO, we actually have many, many flavors <coughs> compared to people have previously have in mind just one flavor depicted by the UF. To understand why they propagate northward, we have to understand the structure of each of them. And this have many, many, so now I have come up with the data sets, and this data set have many, many applications. For example, um, I can, as I said, I'll be studying the mechanisms for each of the flavor, and I'll be studying the climatology of this phenomena, which is important to the climate system. And yeah, also I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all, and especially thank John and Adam for hosting me here for this program. It's a great program, I really enjoyed it. And I want to thank Sam, where is Sam? For, for everything, for organizing this, and for, I have been bugging you all the time. And thank you all. <laughs> so you all get it now, right? Everything's clear? <laughs> so we are just a little bit ahead of time. Um, uh, if you do have questions, maybe uh, we can circulate around a little bit later and do that. I want to add my thanks to you for coming on this miserable day. Um, remind you that we do this every semester, that you'll see different people, but uh, by the time everybody's done their two years, they will have all presented here at least once, most of them perhaps twice. So you'll see people sort of in their beginning stages and a little bit at their end stages as, as well. Um, we do this to uh, show off, basically, uh, what wonderful postdocs we have, uh, show everybody um, how clever we're being in, in recruiting them all. And, um, and I hope I show, they showed you that uh, they've lived up to my claim in the beginning that they're very diverse subjects, all very important subjects studied at the highest level of skill uh, that's possible. So thank you all very much. See you again next semester, I hope. <laughs>